Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So welcome to the conference. Um, I'm Facundo Caregilati. I am an information system engineer and working on the lines. And today we are going to talk about uh, the Y Combinator. So the yeah. <laughs> so the presentation is roughly divided into three parts. The first one is the Y Combinator. <laughs> Then we are going to deny the white combinator using some refactoring, and then we are going to see some consequences of what we do. So this is the white combinator. So you can see that it's very highly inaccessible like, for most people. So I'm going to derive this in less than half an hour. So we better get going, right? <laughs> so I'm going to switch to to a small image, and here we are going to start doing some things. So first I'm going to explain some like previous concepts and then what the problem is so you can understand what we will be doing. So last year I gave a talk about lambda calculus. So lambda calculus is a computation model in which the only thing you have is functions and the evaluation of those functions. So in this talk, we have objects that represent like, a bunch of code or a function, and they are called blocks. Mm -hmm. So for example, I can define here a block that takes an argument to a parameter x and returns x plus 1. So this object represents that function x plus 1. In order to have the value of that block, so to evaluate it, we can send it a message value with the argument. So for example, value 2, and that returns 3. So I redefine the, I, I define other message that is the same thing as value, so that we don't, because we are going to be evaluating a lot of blocks, and if I use just value, we will have to put a lot of parentheses, so I define this message, less and less than, that is the same thing, so it returns 3 as it did before. So we'll be using some refactorings during the, the talk. Um, one of them will be to extract a variable. So for example, I can select this block and choose extract to temporary. And for example, I can name it next. Right? So now when I evaluate it, it still returns three. So that's one refactoring. So everybody knows what a refactoring is, or okay. <laughs> a refactoring is a transformation that you do in the code in order to change the structure of the code without changing its behavior. So the code should do the same thing as it was before. So another refactoring that we can do is to take, for example, any code. So I'll just do two plus one wrap it in a block, <coughs> taking um, an argument, let, let's say y, and then evaluating that block with any with any value, right? So we can use value or less than less than. So this is exactly the same thing as 2 plus 1. So we are making a function that returns 2 plus 1 and it just ignores the, the parameter, right? So this can be automated, so if I go back and have 2 plus 1, I can select it and say introduce a block with a variable name y and a value, for example, min. So it did automatically. Right? So that's another refactoring. Um, so what we can do, for example, here is to do that. So I introduce a new block here with y and a value of, let's say, 1, right? So it should still return 3. And then we can notice, yeah, but we are evaluating this block with a 1, so y is 1. So here we have a 1, so we can replace it with a y, and it still do the same thing, right? Um, okay, so... And the last refactoring that we are going to use is if we have a block, for example, 
here. Okay. I can wrap it into another block that takes an argument, let's say y, and then what it does is evaluate the in, inner block with the thing you pass into it. So you have this three, so y is three, and then you just evaluate the inner block with, with three. So it's the same thing as just evaluating the, the inside block, so it still returns four. So we can also do that automatically, so if I go back to that, so it returns four. I can select this block and say wrap it into a block with a parameter named y, and it does it, so the same thing. Okay, so that's the preliminaries. So what's the problem we are trying to solve? So in lambda calculus, we only have functions and the evaluations of those functions. So we can't just, for example, have a variable and assign a function to a variable. So we can't give a name to a function. So if we have some a recursive function, so for example, let's see, uh, let me find a window here. We have here we have a definition of the factorial function. So we have a factorial of a number is if the number is zero, then it's one, and if not, it's the number times the factorial of the previous number, so number minus one. So this is a recursive function because we are referring to the function from the definition of the function. Right? So we have this factorial that refers to the function. But in order to do that, we have to name the function in the first place. So we don't have that in lambda calculus. So one of the things that we can do, for example, is to replace, in every place that we have factorial, replace it by its definition. So, for example, if we have a variable, x equals to 2, and then we use it in other places, we can just replace every occurrence of x by 2. Right? will be the same thing. We, we can do it, in this case, for the factorial function, because in order to replace this factorial that is inside, we have to replace it with this. But this also includes factorial, and so on. So, the, that, in fact, that's a refactoring, so when we want to replace a variable by its value, it's called inline, so I can try to do it, and say factorial is defined recursively, so we can't do it. <laughs> okay, so our goal will be to be able to define the factorial function without making a recursive call. So without making this factorial call inside. So in order to do that, we will really start uh, with a working definition of factorial. So we have here some tests. The factorial of 0 is 1, the factorial of 1 is 1, of 2 is 2, of 3 is 6, etc. So when I click run test, all the examples run, and then we have here which one pass and which one fail. So if I, if I make an intentional mistake, for example, if I put there 20, then the test failed because well, it gave up, uh, gave up a two, right? Okay, so our goal would be to extract that factorial code from inside the, the factorial definition. So the first thing we are going to do is to select the factorial block and introduce a new block. So we will start refactoring. Uh, the variable name will be myself because we want to like parameterize this factorial call. And the value will be, for now, nil. So that's a refactoring, so everything still works. So then I want to replace this factorial by myself by the variable myself. But in order to do that, I want myself to have the value of factorial, right? So what I can do is, so myself, now it's taking the value of nil, because I'm evaluating the outside block with nil. So I can pass it factorial, everything still works. And then I can notice, well, myself has the same value of factorial, and I have here factorial, so maybe I can replace factorial by myself, right? by the variable myself. So this will be a manual refactoring, so it, it can fail. And if we run the test, it's failing, but why? 
Yeah, so the reason is that here we are initializing the factorial variable. So before when we had it inside, we were referring to the factorial variable when we call the function. Now we are referring to it at the moment at which we are initializing the factorial variable. So it's not initialized yet. So it's nil, so when you try to call it, it fails. So we have to come up with a way to delay the evaluation of this factorial. Well, we can use one of the refactorings we saw. We can wrap it in a block. And in that way, we are passing a block that when it's evaluated, it will return the, the value of factorial at that moment in time. So that passes. OK. So we, are, we have removed the, the recursive code from, at least from here. So maybe we can extract that as, as a, a new variable. So I'll name that as a you know, factorial generator. So, but now we only have the third problem because we still have this factorial going inside the definition of factorial. Okay, so what can we do? Well, one of the things that we can try is, you know, let's just pass it nil, right? We don't want the factorial, let's do the did. They did that, uh, that block that we're referring to the factorial and run the test. So, we can notice that the first test passed the test for zero. Why? Because here we, are, we have a number. If it's zero, we just return one. We don't care what, what the value of myself is, so it's fine. So here we have a function that works only for the factorial of one. Okay? So maybe what we can do is take that and pass it into the factorial generator again. So now we have a, a, a factorial function that just works for zero, and we are passing it to the factorial generator. So now it works for zero and for one, right? Because for in the case of zero, it just returns one. And in the case of one, it goes to here. So this factorial generator refers to myself, but myself, that is the first parameter, is that. And that is a factorial function that works for zero. So here we are sending a number minus one, so zero, so it works. And what happens, so this is a factorial function that works for zero and for one. So what happens if I pass it that function into factorial generator? So now it passes for zero, one, and two. Okay, so we are getting closer to our goal. <laughs> so now what, one choice would be to think what would be the greatest number for which we want to calculate the factorial, and then, okay. <laughs> so, we didn't solve the problem, but we noticed that this factorial generator, what it does is to, it improves a previous definition of factorial by one. So, it, it's a function such that it gets closer and closer to what we want it. And let's suppose that we have a, a work, a full working definition of factorial, if we do that this, so we pass it this magical factorial that comes from nowhere, factorial generator, we'll have the factorial function, right? Because if we pass into this function a zero, it will return a one. And if we pass it any other number, it will return that number times the factorial function, so myself will be factorial, of a number minus one, right? So the factorial generator evaluated with factorial is just factorial. Okay, so that's uh, just a, a, a parenthesis there. Uh, that's called a fixed point of a function. So when we have a value, you give that value to a function and it returns the same value, that's called a fixed point. So for example, uh, the square root of one is one. So one is a fixed point of the square root function. So we'll see that factorial is a fixed point of factorial generated function. Okay. Well, but we are stuck here, right? Because we didn't want to, to pass anything that refers to factorial, but what do we pass uh, to the factorial generator? So maybe, as we know a lot about objects, 
maybe we can try to solve a similar problem with objects and then see what the uh, isomorphism is, like what's the relationship is with this problem, so that we, when we solve the problem with objects, we'll solve this problem. So let's try to pose a problem, like an equivalent problem, but thinking about objects. So here we are dealing with some reference. So we want to remove like the explicit self-reference that we have in the recursive code. So when we are working with objects, we have a, a, a self-reference, that's the self-variable, right? So when we are inside of, of an object and we write self, that is referring to the same object, right? So let's try to imagine what would happen if we didn't have self. So I'll open here another window. Um, here. So here I have defined an object that is a factorial calculator. And we can send a message factorial off with a number, and it returns the factorial of that number. Right? So we can see the definition of the factorial of method here. So it's very similar to what we had before. And here we have, if a number is zero, just return one. And if not, return the number times cell factorial of number minus one. Right? So we send the, the factorial of message again with uh, the previous number, right? To the same object. But let's try to imagine what ha will happen if we didn't have self. So we aren't allowed to write self there. How could we solve that? Well, we need a reference to the object from this method. So what if we just pass it? Right? So we can implement another message that well, we can say myself with the factorial calculator. Myself and factorial of 5. So we are passing a reference to the object explicitly so that we can then not use self. Right? So I'll implement uh, that that method. Okay, so I can try to run it, then create the method in the tutorial calculator. Okay. So here we have myself. I will receive the factorial calculator, so I will name it myself. And the factorial of a number. Or an integer, whatever. Okay. Um, so the implementation of this will be very similar to what we have we had before, so I'll copy and paste it. There. But here, instead of using self, I'll use myself, that is the value that I receive um, from outside of it. But here I'm sending the message factorial of, and that is using self, so we didn't solve the problem. But what I can do here is send the same message, so I can say myself passing in the same thing, factorial of a number, etc. Right? So here we are like sending the same object over so that we can continue the computation for the next step without using self. So uh, let's see. So here now I evaluated and it calculated the factorial of five. <coughs> Okay, so we solved that problem using objects. So the trick was to pass to the object itself, so a reference to itself, and then within the method, so within the method, we evaluated using also myself. So we also pass the object uh, to the to the next like iteration of the method. So we can do it the same thing here. So we can pass the factorial generator itself, and then this myself will be the factorial generator. And the factorial generator function receives a function as the first argument, right? So then I can here say myself. Mm -hmm. So this exactly the same thing as we did with the, with the objects. If I run the test, they work. So with this, we effectively have recursion without self-referencing. So because we are referring to factorial generator from within the factorial generator function definition, and we are referencing factorial from within definition. So now what we can do is to align it, because now we can. So uh, in 
in like that. And we can also inline the factorial function, so in like that. <laughs> and everything still passes. So it works. So I always undo that. <laughs> so what we need is enough to prove that we can have recursion without explicitly calling the same function from within itself. So we have we can have recursion from lambda calculus. But I think this is not enough because we, are, we have this mechanic that we are using to make the, the recursion work inside the logic of the factorial function. We have to remember to pass it myself and so on. Uh, and I mean, we are polluting that logic and I will want to separate the logic of the function from the mechanics that makes it recursive. So now I'll try to extract this myself to myself code. Um, so what we can do is to take this and introduce a new block. So the value will, will be, I don't know, um, something. They can't come up with a good name for this value yet. The value can be new. So now we wrap it, uh, we introduce a new block, right? So everything still passes. And then what, what I want to do is to pass, instead of passing it here new for something, I want to pass myself value with myself so that we can after replace this by something. So I will copy this and paste it instead of new. So that's a manual refactoring, so it could fail. So if I run the test, stuck to deep. So we are getting into an infinite recursion. Why? Well, before we were evaluating this myself with myself only if the number wasn't zero. So we had a condition, so we didn't always evaluate it. But now we have this myself to myself code outside of it. So we are always evaluating it, so we are entering to an infinite within in an infinite recursion. So we need a way to delay that evaluation. Well, we already saw how to do that. So we can wrap it in a block. So I can wrap it this into a block using that refactoring. So now it won't be evaluated until it's needed. So now everything passes. Well, but now something doesn't have exactly the same thing as myself or myself. So uh, I. I want it to be exactly the same thing, so I can wrap this into a block. And so everything still works. And now I see, yeah, the something variable has this value. And that's the same thing as what we have here. So I can say, here's something. It still works. And now we see, I'll just leave this uh, unnecessary parenthesis. And now we see that here we have our original generator. Right? So it's the same thing, we have only uh, just one function call here. So this isn't, I mean, this wasn't the factorial generator that as we had before. That was like a self-passing factorial generator, so I will rename it. So, because that included the mechanics of passing into itself and so on. So the actual factorial generator is here, so this. So I'll start it to a temporary whole factorial generator. Okay, so now we were able to isolate the logic of the function. So there, instead of something to be like the next step or I don't know what, next step. So we were able to isolate the logic of the function from the recursion mechanism. Uh, but now we have this self-passing factorial generator and this self-passing with self-passing and so on. I want to like extract the, all the mechanics inside just one block. <coughs> so what we can do is to inline this self-passing factorial generator. So we have it here, here, and here. So you can inline it, so everything still works. And then we have this hard-coding reference to the factorial generator, so I want to use this block to, with any generator. 
to want to extract it. So what we can do is to introduce a block, so what we already saw, I'll call the variable generator, and the value would be the factorial generator. And now we see that the generator variable has the factorial generator as a value, so we can replace this with the generator variable and this with the generator variable. And now we have everything, all the recursion mechanics inside just one block. So I can extract this as a variable, so for example, make recursive. And now we have that the factorial function is the factorial generator, which defines a function which defines the logic of the factorial function, passed into this magical block called make recursive, that makes it recursive, <coughs> but without a self, an explicit self reference. So this make recursive block is the Y combinator. So we rename it to just Y. <laughs> so, we can see that mathematician doesn't like um, like Indian regular names. Um, so why why? So if you look at in Wikipedia, for example, you won't find it using these names like generator and so on. So instead of generator, they use just X. So F, I mean F F. So rename rename it to F. And instead of using here myself. Um, they use X, so I'll rename this as X, and then this also. <laughs> rename it to X. Okay. This looks much better. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you ask a mathematician, a mathematician why, so if you just make some new lines, so we can see the symmetry that it has. So, um, you can see the Yeah. Yeah. Large screen. This is the Y Combinator, but this a special version of the Y Combinator. It's a version for um, non lazy languages. So here we have this, and these are like wrap blocks. Uh, but we wrap because we were evaluating them always. If we were in a lazy language, we only evaluate them when we need it. Uh, so this is actually called the set combinator. So the Y combinator is the version for lazy evaluated languages, but it's the same thing. Uh, so what it does, it takes a function that when you apply it to itself, each time it improves it, uh, and every, in every step you are getting closer to what you, you want, and then it returns the fixed point of that function. So we already saw that the fixed point for the factorial generator was the factorial function. So if we pass factorial to the factorial generator, it gives back factorial. OK. Um, so that's the Y combinator. Uh, we don't have much time left, but um, then I wanted to show it very quickly uh, what the implications of, of, of it um, we were able to extract it. So, yeah, we had the Y combinator, but what we did was to decouple the recursion from the logic of the function that is recursive. So, yeah, we have now two functions that are decoupled, so what are the benefits? Right? So, usually when we decouple, we have some benefits. So, let's say, for example, that I have another function, so let's say Fibonacci. Right? Here I have, so Fibonacci is a sequence in which the, the nth number is the sum of the previous two numbers. So it starts with 1 and 1, and then goes 2, and then 3, and then 5, and so on. So here we have it defined recursively. To be able to use it with the Y combinator, I just copy the definition from here to there. And then we'll want the Fibonacci generator. So in order to do that, we'll want to Produce a block, the variable will be myself, and replace the Fibonacci calls with myself, right? Just the same thing as we did with the factorial, and then pass this block, that is the Fibonacci generator, to y. Y 
everything still passes. So I will extract this as the Fibonacci generator. Okay. So what happens if I want to evaluate as a large Fibonacci number? For example, here the 40th Fibonacci number. So I'll uncomment it and run the test. And then it times out. Because we are doing a lot of recursive calls, <coughs> and that takes a lot of time. Right? Because we are evaluating for the Fibonacci, let's say, of 10, we have to, we will want to have the Fibonacci of 8 and 9. But for the Fibonacci of 9, we also have the 8 and 7. So we are calculating the 8th one <coughs> two times. And for the 8th one, we also need the 7 and so on. So it's uh, increasing exponentially. So maybe what we want is to memoize it. So to every time when we say, well, I want it for an of two, if we didn't calculate it before, well, we calculated it. But if we did calculate it before, we just return what we already have calculated uh, before. It. So in order to do that, we'll have to here, in these two calls have like a dictionary, and then also, like, if we didn't have the value of the dictionary, then we want to calculate it, add it to the dictionary and return it. If we already have the value in the dictionary, we want to take just that value and return it without calculating again. But before, we didn't, we weren't able to do it without polluting the logic of the Fibonacci generator because we have here a direct call to Fibonacci generator, so we could intercept that. Now that we have the decouple, then we can, for example, define, uh, sorry, um, let's see, we can define, for example, a memoize block, right? So this memoize takes a generator and returns that generator, return that generator memoize. So it creates a new dictionary so that when you evaluate the function, if the value was in the dictionary, it returns it without calculating. And if it wasn't, it calculates it and it puts it in the dictionary. So then we can have here, instead of passing the, mem the Fibonacci generator, we can pass the memoize, the result of going memoize with the Fibonacci generator. Now the test runs like instantly. Right? So we were able to do that without touching the Fibonacci generator, so without touching the logic uh, for that. So we can implement a lot of that's that's a pattern, it's called decorator. We can implement a lot of them. So I don't have uh, enough time to show all of them, but uh, for example, we can implement, uh, sorry, we can implement uh, some, uh, uh, let me find a window, sorry. We can implement, uh, for example, logging to log before an evaluation, to log after an evaluation, or we can even uh, implement like a tail call optimization using this, so because we can intercept the recursive calls, we can implement a block that does um, that does that optimization. So I have one implemented. So if after the talk, uh, you're going to see it. So uh, you can find it. <laughs> okay. So we have derived just the, the Z combinator. So using refactoring some tests and. What I find it, uh, interesting is that, is that when you try to explain it using a deductive approach, so you show it and you prove mathematically that it works, you don't like understand it well and you can't like see the implications of it. But when you do it constructively, so you can, you are step by step constructing it, so um, incrementally, you can see it better and you can see uh, what are the implications coupling and so on, and we are using the tools that you, we, we use every day, so we factor in some tests, and so that's uh, very interesting. So here are some of, uh, some resources that uh, so you have to uh, learn more about it, and none of them is in small books, but at least it, it's something. Uh, so that's the talk. So, thank you. Maybe while I'm
when he's preparing his computer, you can ask questions. If you have some questions, you can So, this is very nice, interesting, but uh, why are you doing this? I mean, this, no. uh, do you have a goal or is it just uh, you're trying? Yeah. yeah, my initial goal was to learn more about the web community because I find it interesting and I found it very difficult to understand from what I could find, for example, the video page and so on. So I found it very interesting and also I wanted to explore how easy or hard it would be to try to implement tools that help you derive it incrementally using the same like thinking process that you, you use when you are working like, in everyday life. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I wanted to learn more about it. Um, another example I couldn't show was that you can implement objects using blocks and you can use the white community to implement itself. Self because if you want to see it, you, you can find it right. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, I'm uh, uh, actually curious uh, the next one. Uh, it is, so by using this uh, kind of uh, paradigm, uh, your thinking uh, process change, so you, you proceed uh, your brain <laughs> working in a different way that if that work uh, in, in the case you use the uh, traditional message uh, sense of option. Yeah, so what I found is that you as you only have like blocks and very little functions, you tend to uh, instead of making like potentially big objects, you always have like little very little little things um, that can bring complexity to um, your, the, the thing that I missed was to be able to name messages because it, what, you only uh, have to plot evaluation and you can put a name to it so that's uh, the thing I need to use but uh, yeah, I, I think that you will start to think differently but I don't know, like different but I miss the names What about debugging this? Because it seems it seems uh, a little bit complex for, for the bag and stuff, right? Yeah, it's, it's complex. It, it, it's very complex. Um, I didn't show uh, any debugging because the uh, current implementation of the workplace, if you select everything and talking about, it like, compiles it on, decompiles it, so you lose all the names of the virus, but it's very difficult to debug. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.